doing a little study in the book of Matthew and covering some things, hopefully, will be a blessing to you. And I'm going to be dealing with a portion of scripture this morning that I've never preached on. I've referred to it at times, but I've never preached on it. And that's amazing when you consider that this is a very popular portion of scripture. And I've been preaching for July 28th would be 54 years, and yet I've never preached on this text before. And, uh, and well, maybe I did when, uh, years ago, I did a study through the book of Matthew at another church, I think. And I may have touched on it back then. Probably did if I went through Matthew, but I can't remember. Anyway, Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to be dealing with verses uh, 13... Uh, through 16. Now this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. So these are the words of Jesus and a very precious portion of Scripture and it pertains to believers. Believers at that day, believers of every day, and believers for us today. And so it has application to our situation. Uh, this is something that's important. It's something that you need to know and understand. We're living in a world of darkness. We're living in a world of sin and debauchery. And we're living in a world that just about is ready to come to the ending of the way. I don't mean that the world will end, but the world as we know it is going to change drastically because Jesus is coming again. And what the Lord needs today is people that are being exactly what he intended them to be, and that which is presented in these verses. Now here's what it says. Ye, let's just put your name there. Andy, Rick, Angie, Donna, Diane, me, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Notice, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now remember, you're not saved by good works. You don't go to heaven by doing good works. You can't earn your way in. But Ephesians 2.10 says we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and therefore good works are to be characteristic of the life of a believer. Our defining characteristic is love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. However, works are to be characteristic of true faith. Uh, James touches on that tremendously, and he says that with our works, we're to evidence our faith. It's an inner faith that begins deep within, that works its way out in our hearts and, and our lives. Now, the Bible depicts us here under two symbols. One is the symbol of light, and the other is the symbol of salt. Have you ever considered yourself to be salty? Have you considered yourself to be a light? a source of blessing and instruction and direction and help unto others. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I, I've never given that a lot of thought. Uh, when I think about salt, that never impressed me. Now, I've read this many times. But the idea of being salt never impressed me because I grew up not really knowing much about salt. Uh, we were so poor we couldn't afford salt, and I had grew up literally without salting my food. I didn't know what it was to season your food with salt and pepper and all these spices. I just took it as mother gave it to me and ate it and consequently I never learned to use salt. I still don't use it much today. Uh, when I thought about salt, I thought about something evil because I've always heard that uh, uh, salt could be bad for you and that salt will give you high blood pressure 
and it's something to be avoided. And in that sense, I can see how that can relate to people because there are some people that will give you high blood pressure. <laughs> there are some people that are not good for you to be around, and there are some people you should not take in. But that certainly wasn't what Jesus had in mind when he was talking about the fact that ye are the salt uh, of the earth. Uh, we began to think about that, and as I did, I began to take a little bit of a study, personal study, on this matter of salt and see what it really is and uh, how important it is to us and to our body and to our life. And I was surprised uh, at the uh, things that I found out. I literally found out this. A lot of the problems that I've had in my life physically over the years, I believe, has been as a result of a lack of salt. And uh, so... I looked at it, and here's what it says. There are many benefits to salt. First of all, it aids your digestion. I had no idea. Over the years of time, I've had problems with my digestive tract, and they tell me that salt aids your digestion. It is necessary to maintain body <coughs> movement. Uh, those of us who have arthritis and crippled up the way we are, it could be possibly because we haven't had enough salt in our diet. It helps us to maintain our iodine deficiency. It helps us with rehydration. It helps to reduce the risk of diabetes. Uh, some of us have diabetes, and, you know, I didn't have any salt. I didn't know that it would help you to avoid diabetes, so I never uh, used it, but it helps to risk that uh, salt water gargle can help to maintain good oral health. Now, I do know that uh, over the years, when I've had a sore throat, it can be very beneficial to take uh, salt and put it in water and gargle with that. Further, it helps to maintain a healthy blood sugar level. It helps with allergies, and listen to this, it helps with asthma attacks. It helps maintain good stomach acid and digestive control. Now, I've always had excess stomach acid. I've had surgeries and been on Maalox and all of that all the time, realizing, not realizing, it could be because of my salt deficiency. It lowers adrenaline spikes. It improves the quality of our sleep. Those of us who aren't sleeping properly, it could be because there's not a lot of salt in our diet, and it helps to maintain a healthy weight and aids in our metabolism. Now listen to this. It supports your thyroid function. I have hypothyroidism, as some of you do, and uh, it could be very possibly that is because I did not get enough salt. So uh, in my own life, as I look back over it, I'm thinking, you know, that I don't have high blood pressure. They took my blood pressure the other day, Thursday, and it was 140 over 55. Hey, that's pretty good for an old fat man. And I'm gonna tell you something, it's because I'd never fooled with salt. But how many times have I suffered because I didn't? It helped reduce stress hormones. It greatly improves the taste of food, and it is a wonderful preservative. Now, back in the day, you guys can't remember this, but I remember when there was no such thing as a refrigerator. I remember when people used to get chunks of ice, and we had a spring, and we had an ice box, and we'd keep stuff in at the spring, and uh, that's where you kept your stuff. Or maybe if you were going to uh, uh, try to preserve some meat or something, you'd use salt. Now, uh, I look around today and I see the scarcity of food. It scared me so much that I started a garden. I've got squash coming on now. I've got squash up there. I've got little green peppers. I've got little green tomatoes. And uh, I've got cucumbers. And I've got potatoes out there. And, well, they say they're not going to have it in the, in the store. Joe Biden is hoarding it all for some reason. And uh, so, anyway, uh, I, I started a garden. But I remember when I was a kid, I was born in 45, right after the war ended. And back in that era, there was a scarcity of a lot of things. And people, in order to survive, uh, they, they had what they called victory gardens. Uh, many of my relatives, all my relatives, had huge gardens. Some of them had three. They literally grew everything they were going to eat. Not only that, but they raised their animals. They slaughtered their hogs. But I remember what they did when they slaughtered that hog. They had what they called a smokehouse or a, a meat house. And it was a dark, damp, cool place. And they would take their hams in there. 
their bacon in there, and they would salt it all down, and they'd hang the hams from the ceiling, and the bacon would be out in great big slabs on these great things, but they were all covered with salt. And uh, that salt would preserve them and take care of them for the longest time. So you can see in this that salt is very important uh, to our, our diet, and salt can be tremendously positive. And when the Bible speaks of you and I uh, be likened unto salt, it's saying that we can make a positive and are to make a positive contribution to life not just to our situation. Now most people strive to make life better for themselves or for me and mine uh, selfishly, but the Bible teaches that, friend, uh, we are to be a blessing and a help unto others. Now, uh, we are to be salty and we have God in our hearts and lives and we have and are to display God-like qualities and in so doing, we are being salt. Now those qualities would be, what is God? The Bible says God is love. What is God? Uh, we should have joy. We should have peace. We should have kindness, meekness, honesty, righteousness, justice, grace, sincerity, restraint, self-control, and above the temptations and evils of the world, and able to be a blessing and a help unto others, able to be a true friend, faithful and true, never changing and help to improve the lives of others. Now, when you think about that, and you think about yourself, can you honestly say that your life experiences has been a, a salty one? Can you honestly say that the qualities of a salt are found in your life and that you have possibly helped to preserve? You know, uh, I know myself, I doubt that I'd be alive today had I not been saved. And I think coming to Christ and those that had talked to me and witnessed me and helped me to come to the Lord, they actually were like a preservative to me because I received Christ. And I think by so doing, I prolong my days upon this earth. And folk, uh, I'm thinking right now, over the years of time, uh, you know, uh, years ago when we started out, we were very zealous about winning souls and preaching and teaching and going out and I uh, worked the bus route bringing in uh, many many people. I had a bus with seat 49 people every Sunday. I brought in about many like that for years. We started churches, churches existing today and I'd like to think that we have been uh, helpful, that we've been a preservative, that we've helped to win and to see many people saved by the grace of God. And folk, uh, you need to think about that. Can you honestly say that you have cons been concerned at all about others? Can you honestly say that you've tried, that you've made a positive uh, contribution to the lives of someone else? Now, I'm not talking about just family and friends. Everybody loves their family. Everybody loves their friends. But I'm talking about, in general, uh, you know, Don and I went to Dr. Thursday. Believe it or not, I got that booster, that second booster, and I'm going to tell you something, be weary of that thing, that thing knocked me off my feet uh, for about uh, three days now, I'm still not over it, and the fever and the stuff that I, I've gone through from it, it's not, I've been in, it's far worse than the first one, or even the second booster, but when we were there, we met a nurse, and met with a lady, actually she was a social worker, and uh, we talked with her, and uh, the minute she saw us, she said, I remember you. And uh, she had run across us somewhere, and she said, what I remember is, she said, you're the nicest people. Uh, well, you know, Don and I have talked to a lot of people, and that seems to be what many people say. Uh, what that tells us is there must not be many nice people out there. There's a lot of ugly, nasty, <laughs> rude people uh, that are so selfish. I mean, the road rage is... I remember the day when there was courtesy of the road. I remember the day when truck drivers were called Knights of the Road. And uh, they were a police officer's best friend back in that day. You broke down, you could always depend on a trucker to help you or back you up. Many a trooper has been backed up by an old truck driver, see him in trouble and pull over to help him. It's not that way anymore. And when you're out on the road, be careful because they're shooting 
and killing every day throughout America, uh, drive-by shootings and all of that sort of thing. So when someone is displaying a Christ-like characteristic, people are going to take note of it, and folk, you're going to shine like a light in a darkened valley. Even when you do not feel good, uh, many of us are at the age where uh, there's, there's seldom been a day in recent years when I got up and thought, Whoo, glory to God, I feel good today. I think I could go out and plow the back 40. Uh, I haven't had a day like that in so many years, I almost forget, forgot it. Uh, every day, many of us have problems and handicaps and difficulties that are, are going on. And, uh, and sometimes we may not feel overcome with joy. But we need to maintain a consistent life, a faithful life, to where the people can see the Lord in us. They're looking for it. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Now, if you don't have that saltiness, what's he say? You're good for nothing to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. Uh, you need to be having those Christ-like uh, characteristics. And I think that you need to ask yourself, can I honestly say that I have been beneficial, that I've had a salty effect upon the people about me. Then he gives us another analogy and he says that ye are the light of the world. Now folk, uh, the light of the world, you know, uh, the average person wouldn't think that. We, we think of the intellectuals and we think of the movers and shakers and the inventors and the politicians and, and the leaders. And, you know, they're the light of the world. They're leading us forward and they're leading us onward. Uh, but no, Jesus was speaking to this poor group of people who was assembled his faith, who had nothing more than faith in God, assembled at his feet. And he says to them, you are the light of the world. Now, God sees things much differently than you and I see them. And today, I was listening this morning to the news a little bit, and it was talking about this basketball player, and how that he is the, fourth, the first, rather, sports figure in American history to become a billionaire by playing sports. He makes, I think, 58 million a year, uh, almost as much as you, Rick, 58 million a year, <laughs> but the man's literally become a billionaire. And people would look to people like that and say, now, there is a man that's making a contribution to life and to society. Look at the delight he's bringing. And, you know, there's that Tom Cruise, you know, that uh, Top Gun Maverick I heard this morning on the news. That thing just grossed about $250 million. It set a record, and it's going for hundreds of millions more. And, you know, everybody's talking about it. Everybody's good. And, oh, that's the light of the world. Oh, that's so wonderful. Some people think Joe Biden is, and Harrison, and Pelosi, and Schumer. They're the leaders. They're the power in America. They're the light of the world. Well, uh, Jesus didn't see it that way. He looked to these simple believers, uh, farmers, and merchants, and fishermen, and he says, ye are the light of the world. Now, in order to understand that, we need to understand the importance of light. And so I did a little bit of study about light. What does light do? Well, light is responsible for all life on this planet. The production of life controls the cycles of the ocean. It helps with the magnetic fields around the earth. It helps with gravity, with warmth, with weather. Light helps the body produce vitamin D, and this helps uh, balance the calcium that body needed to maintain healthy bones and teeth. So if you want to have good teeth and bones, get out in the sunshine, get some vitamin D. Light helps ward off, here you go, depression. I think that's why that every morning I get up to watch the darkness dissipate and the dawn coming on and the rising of the sun, and I rejoice in that. It helps ward off depression. It's used literally in the treatment of depression. It helps abolish sadness. I'm told one time of an individual who was suffering tremendously from depression, and as evening came on, and the darkness began to settle in. He began to get depressed. But as he took looked to the sunset and he could see the final rays of day, that his uh, depression was eased, that he was helped and encouraged by so doing. The brain starts to produce serotonin as soon as we wake to the light of day. 
Light kick starts the food chain, both on earth and in the sea. Light is an important tool for helping us make our way through life. It shows the way and so many other things. Now, I said all that to say this. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And dear friend, uh, I can understand that. When I look back in, in my history and, and I think about people and the influences that they've had upon me, I can call to mind many wonderful people who helped me to see, to understand what Jesus was about. There have been people that I've known that radiated the very presence of God. You know, the statement has been made that you may be all of Christ that some people will ever see. You know, most people don't read the Bible. They don't look in there to see who Jesus is. And the only way they have of telling who Jesus is is in the hearts and lives and faces and speech and life of individuals who profess to know him. And they may say to you, so when you throw your cursed blue streak and, and they look at you and say, so that's a Christian, huh? That's what Jesus is like. You know, there's a lot of bad testimonies out there. And there are a lot of people that are not displaying light. They're not pointing men, women, boys, and girls <coughs> unto God. Uh, friend, ideally we're like, to be like we're supposed to be like salt. We're supposed to be light. Uh, light and our lives are to be shining in such a fashion. Now Jesus said here, you know, let your light so shine. Let that light with this, which is in you. Now if you're saved, you have the light of God within your soul because the Holy Spirit of God's within you. If you're saved, we're to be told to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to have power. You're going to have love. You're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have contentment. You're going to have gentleness, meekness, temperance, self-restraint. And you're going to manifest a Christ-like characteristic. And in this age of darkness and evil, that's an important thing. You know... Uh, my wife tends to watch IDTV and some of these TV programs where the crime that takes place in America is set forth on film and they document these murders and such. And Now, you know, as a police officer, uh, we were trained in all that and I saw videos and pictures of murders. I, I think of this one guy out in southwest Virginia who owed a gambling debt. And because he couldn't pay it, they caught him, they cut him up in little pieces, and they threw what was remained into the stream. Well, when they took that out of the stream, they sewed it all back together and had him, his head put back together, his face put back together, and had his family come in and look at that and identify the face. And I, I seen children, a young lady out riding a horse one day, and some guy got a hold of her, and did this, that, and the other, and ended up cutting her head off. And they had all these pictures. Well, we, we went through hours and hours of viewing these things to see, this is what policemen deal with. You don't realize it. The average person doesn't realize it. But the guys that are out, and the guys and gals out there on the street, they know what it's about. And uh, I saw enough of that for a lifetime. And, but Donna likes these crime stories, and she likes to see them caught, and she likes to see them punished and everything. Uh, a friend, I'm going to tell you, sometimes they've got stuff on there. I, I will, I will, I will, when I watch it, I won't subject myself to it. And I'll tell her, you, you want to watch that stuff? You want to watch it? I'm not going to watch it. Uh, the darkness and the evil that some people are capable of doing. And most of these people, most of the victims are these beautiful little girls. Young girls in their teens, early 20s or 30s, mothers with babies, some of them expecting. And these dark, dismal, gloomy characters. You know, talking about darkness every time you turn the news on across the bay overnight. Some guy was stabbed last night and is in the hospital fighting for his life. Others have been shot every day. Somebody's shooting, riding by, killing people, children being killed, people being abducted. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. I remember years ago, uh, I was going up against about 600 people outside of a bar when I was a trooper. 
and uh, they uh, were giving me a, a lot of resistance and one of them said to me, he, I turned around, they hit me in the back with rocks and I turned around to face him and the one guy said to me, he said, Trooper, he said, it's a big dark world out there and threatening me and I want to tell you something, I came to the realization it is a big dark world. And there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of debauchery, there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of misery. And in that dark world, the Lord needs some to show forth the light. Some people to show what life ought to be like, what life could be like, what human beings were meant to do, and what God can do with a life that is surrendered unto Him. Can you honestly say that your life is likened unto light? Can you say that you're giving off illumination? Can you say that you're giving guidance for the, for the way, especially for children? Uh, you know, one of the first things a parent should do when they come along and little babies come along is to realize that little one is an eternal soul that's going to spend forever somewhere. And where that child may spend eternity may well depend on what I teach them and the way I, I lead them and guide them and the example that I set before them. I think that every parent should want to be a guiding light for their family. You know, you guys live on the water here, Chesapeake Bay on one side and Atlantic Ocean on the other side. Uh, you should all be watermen. It's amazing to me how many people on the eastern shore never get on the water anymore. I'm one of them, but anybody that goes out and gets on the water any length of time realizes the importance of a lighthouse. Uh, when I think of a lighthouse, I think about that rotating beacon that most airports will have. And when you're flying and at night in the darkness, uh, you know, many times you can be led to safety by that rotating beacon. You follow that beam and it'll take you straight to the airport. A lighthouse will do the same thing with a harbor. And uh, anybody that's been out in the water and trying to find the way to harbor and they see that lighthouse can follow that beam and lead to, they realize how important it is. Any flyer knows how important that uh, rotating beacon is to help them hone in and to come to the airport. Well, Jesus is a lighthouse, and you understand something, you and I are to be as well. We're to be showing the way. We're to give, be giving direction and help. Now, we live in a selfish age when most people don't really think about that, don't think about others. But dear friend, we have a responsibility. And dear friend, we need to understand we can make and should make a positive contribution to this life in which we're living. You want your life to count for something, you want to be a plus or a minus. So many people have been hurtful, detrimental, and they've done a lot of damage, they've done a lot of harm. They've got a lot to account for one day, realizing that one day we must give account of our lives unto God. You understand something? You're listening to me right now, and you're just thinking, oh, he's just another Lama preacher, and he's uh, putting in his time, and he's just speaking, and I've heard all that stuff before. Well, you better understand something. Uh, this is a teaching of the Word of God. With the privilege that we have in Christ comes responsibility. You're not just saved to sit back and kick back and let everybody serve and wait on you. You are saved to serve. And you have a place and you have a function. And you are to make a positive contribution. Your life is to be like salt. Your life is to be like light. And the Bible says, now don't be shy about this. Look at this, what it says. For the light... A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle or put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, let your light so shine. The devil doesn't want your light to shine. And it seemed to indicate that you and I have the power 
to allow our life to shine or not. Uh, you know, the devil's working at you. The, the world is working at you. But some of us are our own worst enemies, and it's not the devil that's keeping you back. You know, uh, somebody said, the devil made me do it. Well, you know, the devil doesn't do all the evil that's done. He gets the credit for it, but the fact is, man in his own right is about as evil and much that men do is just man doing evil because he's got an evil nature. But you can keep yourself back. He says, let your light, allow your light to shine. Now, you know, folk, uh, you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That light is going to shine in your life. It's going to work out. But we hinder that and limit that by the sins and by the carnality and uh, refusing to let it shine. Let your shine. You have the ability to let it shine or not. And so, folk, you need to understand that, and I need to understand that, that we're making a positive contribution to this life that God has given us. He wants us to be seen, He wants us to be heard, and He wants us to be likened unto a beacon. Helping people to safe harbor. Helping people to avoid shipwreck and dashing themselves upon the rocks and reefs. That is part of the job, certainly, of a pastor. And I think that many people have been spared lives of ruin and sin and debauchery and uh, death by the ministries of God's men. But not just pastors, teachers, and witnesses. You know, folk, in this life, people need direction to find a way to harbor. But there are also rocks and reefs on this sea of life. And many people have made shipwreck of their, their lives. And uh, they've done so because they were traveling and didn't know where they were going, didn't have anyone to guide them, direct them, and help them. Uh, my wife has taken it upon herself and Donna is a tremendous asset to this ministry because she likes to talk and talk on the phone. And all the years that I've been in the ministry, uh, Donna has pretty much dealt with the ladies. Now, she always lets me know, usually lets me go, I think she lets me know what's going on. And uh, I advise her and, and teach her, but I hear her sometimes giving out inf information. And I'm thinking, you know, I ought to put her on salary as assistant pastor. <laughs> Uh, some men on TV, you see them and their wives together, and they've got a co-ministry and a podcast and all of that. Well, uh, Don and I could do that, and she'd sure uh, fill up her part of the bill because uh, she's had a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, and she doesn't want to see people get hurt. She's tremendously uh, smart when it comes to medical things. She used to work for a doctor, and he told me one time, he said, she is smart. And Donna certainly is when it comes. And so she's always giving out advice and trying to help people to avoid sickness and disease and sorrow and things of God. Well, uh, that's not just a pastor and a pastor's wife. All of us are to be like that, concerned about other people. Don't be a shellfish. Shellfish is the most miserable fish in the sea. <laughs> and uh, so you don't want to do that. You want to let your life be like unto salt. Let it like it be unto a light and allowing it to be used for good and not for evil. Now, especially would this be true with our families, uh, but also with our friends, with our siblings and the folks, with all about us, giving light and direction and thus fulfilling the will of God. One day we're going to have to give an account we have opportunity, we have privilege, all the privilege we have today. We have freedom, especially as Americans. I fail to see the light that should be. I fail to see the positive contributions that could be. But dear friend, one day we're going to have to stand before the Lord and we're going to have to give an account. Now you won't give an account to me. I'll probably never preach on this again. I might read it, refer to it, use it as an illustration, but just to preach on it, probably not. But understand something. 
you've heard it, and you're going to have to account for it one day. These are not just words to fill up time. This is a message that can literally help to transform your life. Do you care about other people? Do you pray about other people? Are you making a positive contribution? Or have you possibly lost your saltiness? Has your light been so dimmed that you're failing to have an impact on even your closest family? It's one of those things that one day we'll wish that we had.